Isaiah 54, uh, verse 1, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing, and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wives, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. What that means is, make your tent bigger, because you're fixing to have a bunch of children. Lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles, and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame. For thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken, and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith thy God. For a small moment I have forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness I will have mercy on thee, saith the Lord, thy Redeemer. And then he said, For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills shall be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. God's people said, yeah. I'll tell you something. Whatever troubled past you've got, it's past. God sees it no more. God says, whatever I was upset with you about, whatever, for however long I was mad at you for what you did, I'm over it now because from now on, I'm going to have everlasting kindness on you. And I'm going to bless you. That's everybody in this church. Whatever's past, it's past. Move on. What, what we're about is about what lies ahead, not what used to be back here. Can God's people say amen to that? Now, turn to Revelation 19. I appreciate that, Lynn. Revelation 19. Uh, you pray for me this morning. Um, I've got the verses, but I don't know how to preach it. Okay? So just pray for, pray for your preacher this morning. In fact, let's do this right now. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Because I don't, I don't think I've prayed enough today. I don't feel like I have. So I want you to go before the Lord this morning for me. So that I can preach this the way God wants me to preach it. We're going to preach about marriage. And how important it is. Okay? The institution of marriage. What it represents. And how the devil's trying to destroy it. I want you to think about something. The generation of young people growing up right now, if you were to ask them their opinion of marriage, would they have a high opinion of marriage or a low opinion of marriage? Low. Young people today do not wait until marriage. They don't. They just don't. That's not taught to them anymore. That's not mentioned to them. That's, they're not trained that way. And I'm going to say this. It is a shame when parents will willfully put their daughters on birth control at 14 years old. That's a shame. It is. It's a disgrace to this nation. That we cannot train our children to wait until marriage. As I'm preaching this, I'm not going to be preaching down to anybody. I can't. What affects you affects me. What has tried to destroy your marriage has tried to destroy our marriage. 
What has worked against you has worked against us and our family. So we are not any different than anybody else in this, in this place or anybody else watching online. Okay? I just want you to know that. I'm not... And there are many people in this church and our extended church who have divorced and remarried. So what I'm going to do, as I meant what I said a while ago, we're not about going back and digging up the past. That's not what I'm going to do. We're going to take it from this day and we're going to move forward. And we're going to say, God, we want your very best in our life from this day forward. Whatever, whatever mistakes I made in the past, whatever I used to do, let that be gone and over with. From this day forward, I want your very best in my life. Amen? So you pray for me this morning. Heavenly Father, I know the devil hates this. I know he doesn't like uh, the idea of marriage. He doesn't like the union of marriage. He doesn't like what it represents. Because one of these days, Jesus Christ is going to appear in the clouds. He's going to receive his bride into himself. And he's going to take her into his everlasting kingdom. And the devil wants that kingdom. And he does not want us inhabiting what he sees as his dwelling place. And so, Father, here's how I see it. I think the devil hates the union of marriage the way you established it in the Word because of what it represents. It represents your Son. It represents your Son and His virgin bride. And He hates it. And He seeks to defile it, corrupt it, even prevent it from taking place. That's what He seeks. Father, you know the struggles that Lisa and I have had. They're very real. And they could have easily wiped us out. But your grace truly was sufficient for us. We found that out. So, Father, the things, Lord, that you lay on my heart to preach today, I thank you, Lord, that I know a little bit about it. Because I've been there. So let me be a blessing to somebody today, not a curse. Let me be a, a help to someone, not a hindrance. And Father, we just thank you, Lord, that you have given us this gift. This gift called love. True, perfect love. Undefiled love. Incorruptible love. We thank you, Lord, that you give us that and that we have someone in our life to share it with. And Father, for those, Lord, who have nobody in their life right now, they have you. And are you not better than husbands and children and the riches of this world? Are you not better than all of those? So, Father, Lord, help me to preach this. Help us give us some understanding, Lord, of what's going on around us. Of what the devil's trying to do. When things don't look so well in our homes. Lord, help me to preach this, Lord. I don't know how to do it. So, Lord, use your word and let it be effective in somebody's life today. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. In, in Revelation 19, verse 11, I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he did judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no one knew but he himself. And he is clothed with the vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. Now turn back in that same chapter to verse 6. Turn back to verse 6.
And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a mighty thundering, say, Hallelujah! For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice, and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they, all, are, are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Needless to say, I believe in marriage. I believe in God's version of marriage. Not what Nancy Pelosi and Barack Obama and the Supreme Court has decided marriage should be. But I believe in God's version of marriage. One man for, with one woman for life. That's what I believe in. Now, God hates divorce. There are exclusions to that. But also, God forgives all sins and all bad things, including bad marriages. God forgives them. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give you some lesson on divorce and say, those of you divorced, you need to leave our church because you have no place in here. You, I, I don't believe that. What I believe is, whatever state you are in right now, God can bless that. God wants to bless that. God will bless that. And from this point forward, we move on. And we say to the devil, and we say to the past, never again. Never again. Because we've all had, we've all made mistakes. We've all had bad experiences. We've all had rough lives. A lot of it at, to, at our own doing, done by our own hand. And we've hopefully learned from those things. And we're ready to say, God, I'm ready to grow up. I'm ready to move on. And I don't want anything that I used to be or used to be a part of. I want nothing to do with that from, from this day forward. God, I want my life, I want my house, I want my home, I want my family dedicated to you. And you know what? It takes one spouse in the marriage to do that. God will still bless that. God will still bless that. If just one man or one woman in a house, in a family, will stand up and say, God, I want your blessings, I need your blessings in my family and on my house. I know my husband's not right, I know my wife's not right, I know my children aren't living right. But God, I endeavor to serve you. God, will you bless my family for your sake and your kingdom? I believe God will do that. Do you believe that? Say amen. amen. Now, let me kind of run through the Bible very quickly on the importance of marriage. God laid it in my heart uh, several years ago. That just, just one, I was just thinking about, thinking about marriage, thinking about my marriage. And God laid it on my heart to love. Not just my marriage, but the idea and the institution of marriage. It is worth staying married. It's how God worked in me. Mike, doesn't matter what you go through, doesn't matter what she goes through, doesn't matter what hardships you encounter. The institution of marriage in and of itself is worth honoring. Do we not call ourselves Christians? Do we not believe in the Bible? Do we not trust the Lord Jesus Christ? If we do those things, then we are saying that we consent to God's institution of a man and a wife together for the rest of their life. How long... Is Christ going to be married to his church? Until the day they die. Which is never. You think your marriage is long? <laughs> Let me just run through some verses very quickly. You can try to stay up with me or you can just kind of read along. Matthew 22, 2. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. God said his kingdom has to do with marriage. Matthew 25, 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be like an unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet who? The bridegroom. And five of them were wise, five of them were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Again, the kingdom of heaven 
is likened unto a marriage. John chapter 2 verse 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. The very first uh, miracle that Jesus did, he did at the wedding. He was bid to the wedding. He consented to the wedding and he blessed the wedding by his presence and by providing the wine. <clears throat> Excuse me, Hebrews. By the way, there's two types of wine in the Bible. And this plays heavily into the kind of marriage that you're going to have. The new wine of the Bible comes directly from the cluster. That means it's not been corrupted by leaven. Leaven has not gotten into that. And, and drained all the sweetness out of it and replaced it with alcohol. Leaven pukes alcohol. Which pukes out of people, amen? If that's the kind of wine you're going to have in your life, that's the kind of wine that you're going to have in your marriage. You're gonna ha if you're going to have corrupt wine in your life, then you're going to have a corrupt marriage. Alcohol, you listen to me, alcohol does not save a marriage. Alcohol does not make a better marriage. Alcohol does not make a better husband. Alcohol does not make a better wife. It doesn't. The lack of strong drink is a benefit to both husband and wife and children. Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage is honorable. In fact, turn there, and I want you to underline this verse in your Bible. Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage is honorable in all. And I want you to look at that next phrase. And the bed undefiled. Y'all know what that means, right? Your bed must be undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. See, nobody wants that. Nobody wants to think about that. Nobody wants to talk about that, including a lot of preachers. They don't want to have, they don't want to mention this verse in church. They don't want to bring it up. So instead, you'll have church services where the pastor is going to talk sleazy for about 30 minutes to everybody. He's going to talk dirty. He's going to talk about how you can have a hot romance in your marriage. And all that, he's trying to excite the wicked, covetous desires of the lost people in his community. And he's trying to draw them into his church thinking, if I get them in here through lasciviousness, by talking dirty, then I can introduce Jesus to them and they will get saved. That man's an idiot. That man is defiled in his mind. There's no doubt in my mind that a preacher who will preach like that and do things like that, he's got a dirty mind throughout the week. Zero doubt in my mind. Marriage is honorable and all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. You can either do it God's way, or you can do it your way. God will bless a marriage... And he will curse adulterers. Just try it and see. Ephesians 5, 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother. Shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. In fact, turn back to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Before. Before there was a church. There was a marriage. Before there was a bishop, before there was a church service, there was a marriage. Before these cities were built, before there were kings and governors and rulers, there was a husband and a wife. The moment that God put a man on this earth, and he says of all of his creation, God saw that it was good, God saw that it was good, God saw that it was good, he looks at man and he says, it is not good that the man should be alone. 
So before anything else that ever shows up in this world, there was a husband and there was a wife. So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him help meet for him. And if you look in verse 21, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, he brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She should be called woman, because she is taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. How many men's in that marriage? One. How many women's in that marriage? Jesus himself even quoted this, giving his consent and his blessing to it. Marriage is one man and one woman. Now you say, well, what about Abraham and what about David and Solomon? They had all them wives. Surely God's in that. God was never in that. God, you never, you never see God consenting to the multiple wife issue. God's version of it was one man. And one woman. Always. Okay? You know, you know what I think Abraham did? I think he did wrong. The fact that Solomon had multiple wives does not add to his godliness and his wisdom. He shows forth in his own life the fallacy of having multiple wives. They tried to kill him. They were, they were out to destroy him. He ended up making false temples to their false gods. And at the end of his life, he's writing down, and he's writing the book of Ecclesiastes, and he's not saying, I had a thousand women. I wish I'd have had two thousand. He doesn't say that. He said, it's all vanity. He said, I have everything that a man could want. He says, vanity and vexation. He said, guys, don't even go that route. I went down that road. I did not find what we all, all us men are looking for. I did not find it at the end of that road. And I had it more than anybody else in this world. And I found nothing at the end of it. One man and one woman. God does not bless. A man. I've had people call me. I had a lady call me several years ago. And she told me that her husband was trying to talk her into having another woman be part of their family. And he said, well, look, God, look, God told Abraham to have these wives. Look, David had all these wives. Solomon had all these wives. All these kings had all these wives. I think God is leading me. I think God is leading me to have another woman as be a part of our family so we can honor God. And I said, ma'am, let me tell you the truth. Let me tell you what, let me tell you what your husband's really thinking that you can't see in his head. If you can't see it, then you're blind. All he's wanting you to do is give consent for him to lust after, more than likely, it's going to be a younger version of you. And she said, yeah. He's got his eye on this, on this gal that's younger than us. I said, all he's doing is wanting to be in bed with another woman and have you give your consent to it. I said, he's not out to please God. He's out to please himself. And she said, thank you for telling me the truth. I said, I am telling you the truth. That's a bunch of nonsense. Even the Supreme Court of the United States of America used to believe that. There's no telling now where our country is going to go because our Supreme Court has corrupted God's version of marriage by allowing, by saying that it's okay for two men to be married together. That is an about See, Satan's attack is already at work. He's out to destroy the very institution of what marriage is. I'm telling you, before, listen, before you build the roof, you got to build the foundation. Before you put the walls up, you got to build the foundation. Before you paint the house, you've got to have the house sitting on a foundation. Marriage, then, is the foundation of all of human society. The institution of one man and one woman raising children for life. That, my friends, is the foundation for everything else we humans want to do right. You look at it historically, the... All the great empires of the world fell into decline and corruption by means of their own immorality. And that immorality almost always is targeted toward marriage and defiling the marital bed. 
Marriage is God's way. Marriage is so important to God that the purpose of the creation, I want you to listen to this now, the very purpose of you existing is so that God could provide a suitable wife for His only begotten Son. The church. This is why not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Because God's pretty picky when it comes to choosing a wife for his son. You remember Abraham? Abraham called his servant Eliezer. He said, Eliezer, come over to me. I'm an old man. My son does not have a wife. Eliezer, I want you to, I want you to give me your hand and I want you to swear an oath. That you're going to go to the people of my, of my own kind. And I want you to find a wife for my son. I, I don't want you to just go out into the land and get any good looking girl. That's not what I want. I don't want you to find a king's daughter. I don't want you to, I, I want you to go to these people right here. And I want you to find a suitable wife for my son. Because my son isn't just going to marry anybody that comes along. This bride has got to be worthy to marry my son. Boy, Abraham had a high opinion of his own son, didn't he? So does God. God does not say, hey, Holy Ghost, just go out, just pick anybody. Just go get them. Go bring in a bunch of them, all right? No, he's sending the Holy Ghost out through the earth to find those very special people. To be members of the body of Jesus Christ. God has high standards. Amen? You young boys, listen to me. You young men, unmarried men. God has high standards for who the wife of his son is going to be. You also should have high standards on who your wife is going to be. If your idea of a good wife comes out of Playboy magazine, you're not going to find a good wife. You're never going to have one. I was taught, and, and I'm just going to say this. Boy, look at them snowflakes out there. They're big. Just think liberals falling out of the sky. <laughs> Preacher Golf spent a lot of time training us, teenagers in this church, young people in this church. And he taught us, you should never, ever, ever Find a mate or look for a mate that, number one, is not saved. Number two, she probably, he or she probably ought to go at least to the same kind of church as you're going to. Because if not, there's going to be problems in that marriage. There's dog fights and, and doctrines all the time, is there not? You don't want to bring a doctrinal fight into a marriage. You've got enough problems already in a marriage, amen? You don't want to fight about doctrine all the time. And I had me a girl, no kidding, I had me a girlfriend one time, I was in high school, and we talked on, a, we talked on the landline phone every night. You know one of those phones that go, shh, shh, Remember those days? There was no speed dial, because the phone went, And me and this girl would talk. Her name was Colleen. And she went to a different kind of church that I did. And you know what? We, we, I mean, we was all just lovey-dovey for there for a while. And we talk on the phone and just talk sweet and everything like that. And then she, had, she tell, said, you know what? My pastor was talking about, you know, I told my pastor where you go to church. And he said that he didn't think you guys were saved. <laughs> what? Yeah, that's just what he said. He didn't think you guys were saved. Well, who does he think he? Boy, I got mad. We broke up that week. You ask anybody that has had a spouse from a different religion. And it's only by God's grace that they're even still married. Because religion is high on the list of our thought processes, is it not? 
let me, let me get back into my notes here so it don't take all day to preach this. This is important. Let, let me, in fact, let me put this up on the screen here. I got two, two deals. Marriage prevention and marriage destruction. Okay? Marriage prevention is the young people that are growing up now. The devil will do everything in his power to prevent young people from ever getting married. So what do we have going right now? We have teenagers, young people in their 20s, going into their 30s, who have had multiple partners, but never a marriage. That is called fornication. And it's wrong. It should be illegal, but it's not. It's wrong. Just because the world allows it, and it's legal, does not mean that it's right. Young people, listen to me. Young people online, listen to me. Do not think that it's ever going to be okay with God that you and your lover shack up and commit fornication and just think in your mind, well, we love each other, so we're just as good as married. Uh-uh, it does not work that way. If it's as good as married, then why don't you get married? See, God sees right through that nonsense. Marriage prevention. Satan seeks to destroy the institute of marriage by either preventing young men and women from ever marrying or by locking them in marriages where the spouses are unequally yoked. In other words, they get married, but they chose the wrong person, and now they're stuck with them, and they're never, ever, ever going to find God's happiness in their life because of it. Now, please keep in mind, I'm not your enemy. And I'm not talking down to everybody like, Lisa and I did it right, what's wrong with you people? Because she will tell you and I will tell you, there are many things we did not do right. And we have suffered the consequences for that. Marriage prevention. How does the devil try to coerce and convince young people that marriage is not for them? Number one, he will give them wicked parental role models. The young people of this generation, the young people of this generation are seeing in their parents that marriage is not for them. Why? Because they see mom and dad, mom and dad are either split up, Mom has, is now on her third husband. And so what that's done is that's brung, brung somebody else's kids into your kids' house. And I promise you, your kids are not fine with that. And now they have to put up with somebody else's kids. Now they have to put up with some guy in the house that's not their dad. Who's bossing them around, telling them what to do. Or neglecting them, or abusing them, or molesting them. Am I making that stuff up? No, I'm not. I'm talking about Jefferson County, America. They have parental role models that do not show forth what godly marriage is all about. It's about a man loving a wife and a wife loving a husband and them getting along together and them working things out because that's what our grandparents did. Our grandparents fixed things. They didn't throw stuff away that didn't work anymore. They fixed it. My mom and dad had good role models. My sister and I had good role models. For the most part. It would have been better for my dad to go to church, but he didn't. I did not let that affect me. In fact, it kind of drove me a little bit. But I'm telling you. I'm going to talk to you adults now. It is your responsibility to set forth the right role model for these children and these grandchildren. Or they don't stand a chance. Number two. The devil will destroy the institution of marriage in young people's minds by schooling and or education. 
Are they teaching in public schools now that marriage is one man and one woman together for life? Are they teaching that? No. So where are your kids going to learn it? Are they going to pick it up on TV? No. Are they going to learn it at school? No. Are they going to learn it from their friends? No. If they're going to learn it, they're going to learn it from mom and dad. The public school system does not teach God's roles as man and woman. It teaches everything but that. It teaches that sodomy is okay, that lesbianism is okay, that it's okay for mom and dad to jump in beds from one bed to another, and it's okay for them to do it. It does not teach them right marriage. Number three, social influences or peer influences. Because you may be trying to raise your kids right, but you let them have sleepovers and you let them go over to somebody else's house where their, their mom is shacking up with some guy, a different guy every month, and those kids are influencing your children. Am I saying this right? Am I wrong on anything yet? What about media such as... Te where, are kids going to get a proper idea of God's version of marriage from the television set? Somebody give me a popular show on TV right now. Just pick one. Pick one. Pick one. Huh? This is us. Okay. What's it about? I don't know what it's about. Life. How many people on that show is married the right way? What about the rest of them? Name me a comedy show on TV right now. Comedy show on TV right now. Um, what's that science show? Big Bang Theory. Who's married on that show? Who's shacking up? It's everywhere. Radio. Katy Perry's trying to tell your daughter that she kissed a girl and she liked it. You gonna let your daughter listen to that? You gonna let your daughter watch MTV? You gonna let your son watch gangbanger hip hop artists who speak some of the most vile, disgusting language to your children? If somebody came up to your child and he used the language that's in most rap songs, you'd pop him in the eye. If you start talking to your kids that way, would you not? Would you shoot him? Would you want to? Then why do you let them listen to that stuff? Why would you let your children listen to that stuff? I went to a pastor's house one time. We were painting. And in his daughter's room, she had about 11, 12 year old daughter. In his daughter's room was the current pretty boy rock stars of the day, posters all over, half-dressed posters all over her that, kid, that daughter's room. A pastor's house. By the way, he turned out to be queer. Music. Unfettered or unfiltered or unprohibited internet. In most American homes... Mom and daddy give their child internet and does not monitor what that child's doing on the internet. What do you think that, what do you think he's doing in there? Let me ask this, what would you be doing in there? If I would have had internet when I was 16 years old and my parents did not monitor what I was doing on the internet, I probably wouldn't even be alive today. It's bad enough we had Benny Hill coming on Channel 11. That was bad enough. Or unmonitored cell phone communication. What was Snapchat designed for? What was it designed for? Somebody tell me. So you could send and receive transmission of images or text that would be deleted after about how, about a minute. So 
somebody else couldn't find out what you've been sending and receiving. Why would you let your kids have that? And then, to top it all off, there is a void of biblical influence and grounding in those children's lives. To top it all off. See, it's hard enough to train children the right way if you are giving them biblical grounding. But when you do not give them Bible teaching, Bible lessons, biblical grounding, when you don't say, hey, get up, we're going to Sunday school. When you say, hey, we go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, we go to church. You live in this house, you're going to go to church with us. When you move out, you can quit going. But if you come in this house, you're going to church. And when parents do not provide for their children that biblical grounding in their life, all of this stuff now has taken over their minds. Do you think they're going to turn out to be good Christian young boys and young girls? They're going to turn out to be perverts and pedophiles. If you go to uh, KMOV's cell phone app, I pulled it up this morning. I like to look at mug shots. Because I'm going, I see these people all around us. That creeps me out. There's a 17-year-old boy mugshot who was arrested for having child porn on his computer. 17 years old! And he's ruined for life! If he gets out of prison, he will be tagged with this perversion deal and that will follow him the rest of his life. Because simply because mom and daddy did not care enough to do something about what that boy was watching on the internet. Plus not get him in church. Boy devil, you came up with a pretty good plan there, didn't you? Is it working? It's working. Because we, Scotty, are now in the minority in this country of people who see marriage as the highest, greatest responsibility and foundation for a civil society. And to keep it flourishing, you must have biblical roles fulfilled in the house. And if you don't, then the foundations are then destroyed and the people will perish. The question I have now is, I want God to save America, but the question now is, is America even worth saving now? Do I want America now to prosper that's the, that's the way our president is taking his, he's taking his country to prosper. Is that good? I guess maybe. But if we are not building alongside that a foundation of biblical morality and the proper roles of a husband and wife in this country, if we're not building that foundation, our prosperity won't matter. You're going to have all the money in the world and somebody's going to eat it up or take it right out from underneath you. You're not going to keep it. God's ways are right, and God's ways are just, and God's ways are holy, and God will not allow a nation to turn their back on His version of morality and exist very long. Have I said anything improper so far? Have I said anything wrong so far? Now, it's about quarter after, and I'm not anywhere near done. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop right here. Not going to go on. Okay? But I want you to ponder now what we've talked about so far. Let me show you one statistic. Look up here. These are the 10 states with the highest divorce rates. Nevada, Arkansas, Wyoming, Oklahoma, Idaho, Kentucky, Alabama, Mississippi, West Virginia, and Delaware. You know what I see here? You know what I see? Half of these states are Mormon belt states. The other half are Bible belt states. 
And they're the ones with the highest... Delaware's uh, number 10, and it's a liberal state. That means 40 other states who are far more liberal than we are here in the Bible Belt or the Mormon Belt. And their divorce rates are nowhere near what our divorce rates is. Now, my theory is... It's because the liberals don't promote marriage anyway. You can't have a divorce rate if you don't have a marriage. So in the states where you've got one part of the state preaching marriage, you've got all the same wicked... Did you know that there's dirty, filthy internet in Salt Lake City just the same there is in St. Louis? So while you have part of the people preaching... Marriage, so these young people are getting married. But they're getting married and they are bringing with them all of the immorality that they've learned in the school and in their role models and their homes and with their friends and the internet and the music. They're bringing that with them. Marriage is busting up. Makes sense, doesn't it? It's working. The devil is destroying marriage and what it means while we're trying to preach it on top, he's destroying it under the foundations and it's going to crumble. What, what kind of chance does your child have of having a lasting, wonderful marriage in these days? There's not much chance. The odds are against them. So what do we do about it? Hebrews 13, 4 again, marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. Whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. I'm not your judge. I'm not your judge. I'd be lousy at it if I was. You're not my judge. The judge I worry about is far worse than you are. And I'm here to tell you, if you play around with perverting God's version of marriage, God will get you. He'll get you hard and get you mean. And if you live through it, you might learn something. If you live through it. But when God sends forth his judgment, oftentimes God gets in a killing mood. And God just starts killing people. Why? They won't live right. Does God have the right to take somebody's life? Better believe that he does. He's the judge and he's the executioner. And if God says this person's going down, that person's going down. Now I'm, I'm talking to church people today. Because I'm here to tell you that when any of this wickedness from these influences start floating into your life, I'm here to tell you that God is going to come. He's going to come to visit you like Jesus visited Nicodemus. He's going to sit down in private with you and he's going to say, I know what you're doing behind your wife's back. Or I know what you're doing behind your husband's back. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you like a friend. And I'm going to say to you, repent. And we need to get some things going in your life to where this is not part of your life anymore. And if you accept that, God will bless you. And God will work in you. And God will start the process of changing you as long as you want that change. But and if you refuse that, do you know what? God's going to let somebody in your life find out what you're doing another witness and then they're going to come to you God's going to use them to talk to you and say hey listen I love you I know what's going on in your life I, I know your husband probably doesn't know but I know and uh, is it true yeah okay then let's repent and I'm here for you if you ever need help you know, I've been down this road and I, and I want to help you. That's a true friend. Amen. And if that doesn't stop you, then here's what God's going to do. 
God is going to take and expose you in front of everybody for who you really are. You see, oftentimes wolves will come into churches, won't they? Oftentimes wolves will slip into family relationships, won't they? God knows how to expose. Who in here would think it would be okay for God to expose every wicked, nasty thing you do? Let that fear drive you. Let that fear compel you. Because the devil will try to convince you that you can keep doing these things and go this way and get by with it and it'll be okay. Nobody will find out. He's laughing at you because he knows how it's going to turn out. God is going to expose you for who you really are. God's going to show everybody what you're made of and what your fashion is. So let that fear drive you to your knees, begging God to change your life. Bow your head. There is no way in the world I'm going to have all on this one. Not a chance. I'd, I'm not preaching this to embarrass anybody. I'm not preaching this to call people out. I'm not preaching this to, to, uh, to expose anybody. So consider this. I'm, I'm honest. I'm, as, I'm going to be honest with you as, as an honest man can be. I have no idea what any of you do with your marriage. I have no idea. Not a clue. Okay? So consider God taking you in private and saying to you, we need to talk. God says, I know what you do. I know how the devil is trying to do your marriage. I'm wiser than the devil. I'm stronger than the devil. Whatever sins you committed, I can forgive. And I can change you. I can fight that devil off easy on your behalf. If you'll let me. But while we're together and while we're just private, you've got some confession to make. And it's time to confess. Folks, I'm telling you, I'm not preaching down to you. I've been there. I've been there. And I'm here to tell you, God has been very, very good to me. God's given me 30, 30 of the best years of my life. I would not want to live a day without my wife being right at my side. God bless me so that when I go somewhere, she's right on my hips. She's right there with me every time. And I'm here to tell you, God is so good and he, he'd be so good to you. And he'll take you and he'll forgive you clean and he'll make you whole. And he'll, he'll start working in your life things that you didn't think could be done. God will start doing them. And God will make you the most happy, blessed husband or wife that's ever walked in shoes. God will do that for you. So right now, when it's just between you and God... Do some confessing. And be honest. Because if you don't, you already know what's coming. Marriage, to me, and honoring Jesus with my life, and honoring the marriage supper of the Lamb with my marriage, that means more to me than anything. 
And the devil will offer you all the lust and all the bad things of this world. He will offer them to you and say, I'll give, oh, wait a minute, I'll give you more than what you've ever had. If you'll just not pray, I'll give it all to you. I'm telling you, what you'll gain in your marriage, you'll never regret it. Never regret it. Father in heaven, we come before you today. And I thank you. I thank you, God, for my wife. Thank you for my children. I thank you for what Lindsay told me last night. Bless me. Because the devil offered me a different life a long time ago. And I thought I wanted that. And I see now, Lord, what I would have missed out on. I see what, I've lo what I would have lost. And I'm so glad, God, that you gave me the woman that you gave me. Father, help these men and women today. Help them, dear God, to fall in love with marriage. To fall in love with what it represents. The beauty of the marriage supper of the Lamb and how it's going to take place. There's not been a wedding or a marriage in this earth that is going to be as grand as the marriage supper of Jesus Christ. And we get to be there as the bride. So, Father, I want to show forth Jesus. And I want my wife to show forth the beautiful church. And I want our lives to be an example of how God can work in a young couple and straighten things out and give them children and give them grandchildren and Let them grow old together. That's what you can do. So, Father, would you do that today? In these, my people. Because their marriage is very important to me, too. And I want them to find the happiness that I found. That's what I want. I want that for all the people that are visiting with us today. I want it for their marriage too. Because if we're ever going to beat the devil in this country, we're going to have to beat him with the superiority of godly biblical marriage. Or we're going to lose. Father, I pray to your God that you would just visit now. With every man, every woman every young person in this room and speak to them and deal with them and help them, Lord. Bring to mind the things that are working against them and give them space to repent. I'm pretty sure, God, they'll do it. Because I know these people well enough to know. I know they're, they like to be honest with you. And they don't want anything, God, in their life that's going to hinder them being to other Christians or other people or even to their children. I think I know them well enough to know, God, that that's, that's really where their heart is. Their heart is where their home is. And that not even this church is as important to them as their own home and their own family. So, Father, bless Cause us to repent. Wash away all of our sins. And Father, help us to follow you in that beautiful, beautiful relationship. Again, Lord, 
to those, Lord, whose lives have been shattered already. Father, help us to not dwell on what used to be or what could have been. Help us, dear God, to dwell on where you're going to take us. That's why we're here. Father, bless your message. Bless your word today. Help these people, I pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, would you stand to your feet? Are you glad you came to God's house this morning?